Uh, well, good morning, Zion Church. Um, happy Sunday after Christmas. Merry Christmas. It's really good to be joining you. Uh, I can honestly say I've never preached over Zoom before, and it seems a fitting way to end the year 2020. Um, so it's really good to be with you this morning. I am going to do something a little cruel today and preach about spring. Uh, and I'm going to do something a little unusual today and preach from the Song of Songs. Um, but I promise that it's all going to make sense at the end of this, and you will see why I'm choosing to do this. So I invite you to hear the word of the Lord from Song of Songs or Song of Solomon 2, verses 8 to 13. The voice of my beloved. Look, he comes leaping upon the mountains, bounding over the hills. My beloved is like a gazelle or a young stag. Look, there he stands behind our wall, gazing in at the windows, looking through the lattice. My beloved speaks and says to me, Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. For now the winter is past, the rain is over and gone. The flowers appear on the earth, the time of singing has come, and the voice of the turtle dove is heard in our land. The fig tree puts forth its figs, and the vines are in blossom. They give forth fragrance. Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So to help us make sense of the Song of Songs, I'm going to pull in some help from our good friends, Peter, Susan, Lucy, and Edmund Pevensey from The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, and a bit of this story. I don't know about you, I watch The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe every Christmas, so I just watched this yesterday, and it's fresh in my mind. And near the end of the story, Lucy and Peter and Susan have gone off with Mr. and Mrs. Beaver to find Aslan, who they know is on the return. And along the way, they meet Father Christmas, who gives them all of these gifts or these tools to use against the White Witch. But Edmund, having fallen prey to his greed and pride and wanting to be a prince, goes off to find more Turkish delight at the White Witch's castle. But things there aren't exactly as he expects. Rather than Turkish delight, he's given a piece of dry bread. He's frightened by all the stone statues he sees. And when he tells the witch what he heard at the beaver's lodge, that Aslan is on the move, Aslan the lion, the, the witch piles Edmund into her sleigh and sets out to find Aslan, turning creatures into stone along the way. So Edmund is very miserable at this point. He knows that he's been tricked that the witch really is evil, and he's very sorry about it all. And some ways into their journey, he begins to notice that things have changed in Narnia. If you will recall, Narnia has spent years and years in a continual winter, where it's always winter and never Christmas. But now there are patches of grass peeking through the snow, and it's getting warmer and warmer. And soon enough, there isn't enough snow for the sleigh to travel over. And so the witch and her dwarf servant and Edmund, who's bound at the wrists, are forced to walk. And things keep changing. This is what C.S. Lewis writes. There was no trace of the fog now. The sky became bluer and bluer, and now there were white clouds hurrying across it from time to time. In the wide glades, there were primroses. A light breeze sprang up, which scattered drops of moisture from the swaying branches and carried cool, delicious scents against the faces of the travelers. The trees began to come fully alive. The larches and the birches were covered with green, the laburnums with gold. Soon the beech trees had put forth their delicate, transparent leaves. As the travelers walked under them, the light also became green. A bee buzzed across their path. This is no thaw, said the dwarf, suddenly stopping. This is spring. What are we to do? Your winter has been destroyed, I tell you. This is Aslan's doing. This 
is no thaw. This is spring. We are a people well-versed in thaws. A few warm days melts most of the snow and the sun peaks out for even just two hours. The temperature rises to just above freezing and we've got our shorts on and the windows open and a little umbrella in our fruity LaCroix. One of my mentors likes to say that spring begins on December 22, minutes uh, the minute when the days start to grow longer and longer and longer, right? We will take any bit of hope that we can scrounge out in these cold and dark days that reminds us that spring is in fact coming. Now, some people have some pretty drastic ways of living into that hope of spring. So John Whitfleet, who's the director of the Calvin Institute of Christian Worship, told us this story of one of his family traditions in one of my worship classes at seminary. So his family picks one Friday in February when they are thoroughly tired of the cold and the dark, and they throw a luau, a party. They crank up the heat in their house, and the kids and their friends come home from school, and they take off their snow pants and their big bulky coats, and they swap them out for Hawaiian shirts and lays. And John brings out the barbecue outside in the snow and he grills burgers and brats and they pass out lemonade and they have a dance party and they just have a really good time. And this party isn't random. It is designed and held with a very specific purpose in mind, right? To remind each other what summer is like, what they have experienced in the past, so that they can look forward in hope for the day when summer will arrive again. And believe it or not, there is a big fancy Greek word for this. It's called anamnesis. Say that all at home right now, anamnesis. So John Whitfleet defines anamnesis as this. It is to savor to dwell in the identity shaping significance of some event, past, present, or future. To savor the identity shaping significance of some event, past, present, or future. In other words, it's the practice of living into, of acting out the reality we know to be true for ourselves because of things that have happened to us, that are happening to us, and that will happen again. So to live as though it is summer, to be our summer selves, because we have experienced summer once, and we know that summer will happen again. That is anamnesis. And the Song of Songs is basically a book of anamnesis. So I know a lot of us think that this book is some random, slightly and unnecessarily explicit love story plopped in the middle of the Bible for no apparent reason. Uh, we don't often hear sermons on the book. And as middle school kids, we all giggled about it after youth group, right? But the Song of Songs is actually the most studied and commented book in the Bible, probably because no one is quite sure what to do with it. In the 13th century, a guy named Bernard of Clairvaux, a scholar and theologian, wrote 86 sermons on the Song of Solomon, and he didn't even make it halfway through the book. But I want to argue that this book plays an important theological role in scripture because the Song of Songs looks backward and it looks forward and so it provides an imaginative telling of how we ought to live in the present. So in looking backward, the book looks all the way back to the very beginning. This song, this love story between a shepherd and his darling takes place in a garden with lush fruit and blossoms and animals. The language evokes a paradise, a place of harmony and joy. So when you read it, it's not hard to picture the Garden of Eden. But more pointedly, the author of the book makes a very clear poetic reference to Genesis. 
So in Song of Songs, chapter seven, verse 10, the woman says, I am my beloved's and his desire is for me. Now, the Hebrew word for desire is sukkah, and it happens only one other place in all of scripture, in Genesis 3, verse 16, where, as part of the curse, God says that man will rule over the woman, and her desire will be for him. So this, in the Song of Songs, then, is a reversal of that. It is a reimagining of things. But it's not swayed toward inequality in the other direction, right? Throughout the poem, the woman says, I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine. This song is a depiction of holy, good, and loving relationships, of any kind of relationship. Our relationship with one another, our relationship with God. This is a portrayal of how things ought to be, how it was in the very beginning with this unrestrained self-giving mutuality. I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine. I am for you as you are for me. So that's how it looks backwards at that first paradise. And then the poem also looks forward. Because this language of lovers and of creation and of newness is echoed at the very end of the Bible in the book of Revelation. This is what John writes there. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a voice from the throne saying, behold, the dwelling place of God is with his people. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, behold, I am making all things new. So the Song of Songs then is a poem, a song found almost exactly in the middle of the Bible that echoes the goodness of that first paradise when all was right between God and his people and points us toward the second paradise to the new Jerusalem. And the lovers in the Song of Songs celebrate that goodness and that rightness in the present. They live into the identity they know is true for them. And this is the Song of Songs. It is the best of songs, the greatest song. This is the most perfect depiction of life. Arise, my love, my beautiful one, and come away. For behold, the winter is past, the rain is over and gone. The flowers appear on the earth. The time for singing has come. This is no thaw. This is spring. Today is the last Sunday of the year 2020. Thanks be to God. (laughs) On Thursday night, even if we aren't holding our usual parties or meeting up downtown or maybe driving to Niagara Falls for the big New Year's bash, I imagine that many of us will stay up to bring in the new year, but maybe more importantly, to see this year out. Uh, We want to ring in 2021 in the desperate hope that the coming year will be better than this one was. Because it has felt like winter for a long time now, and we need a thaw. We want to see things open up again begin again, instead of constantly walking down. We want to see loved ones again and be able to hug them and gather together without that constant nagging worry in the back of our minds of, is this safe? We want to be able to travel. We want to be able to work. And we want to be able to put our kids on school buses and have the house to ourselves. We need a thaw. And it's coming. We have reasons to hope. 
as the vaccine starts to trickle down to more and more people, as we inch our way closer to the season of spring and the warmer days that will make outdoor gatherings easier. But joyous as those things might be, hopeful as those things might be, they are yet a ways off. And right now, the days are dark and cold and lonely. Where is spring now? Well, I would argue that spring is in the manger and spring is in the cross. Because the manger tells us that God came to his people and God is now with his people as the children's message explained and God will come to his people again. God's presence with us is no thought. It will never disappear. This is spring. God is here with us now in his goodness, in full relationship. And the cross then tells us Christ died for us just once. But his death means something for us now. This past event yet applies to us now here in 2020 because it means that we are new creations, that we have been rescued and redeemed. And this, our salvation, this is no thaw either. You can't undo your salvation. No matter what you do, this is spring. You are forgiven always. I know that coming to church these days is not what it used to be. And sometimes we might wonder why we turn our computer screens on on Sunday mornings, why we even bother with all of this. But we come to church, even church on a computer screen, to practice anamnesis, to look backwards at what God has done, to look forward in hope at what is coming, And therefore, to know, to declare the hope and the assurance that we have right now. Even as the things of this world change, as we move from one year to the next, as we have hope one day and disappointment another, as things feel shaky and shifty and unreliable, here we declare, we remind ourselves, we know that we are held and we are loved, and we are forgiven, and that we live in the perpetual spring of God's presence with us. Traditionally, this is the time of the year to set New Year's resolutions. I don't know about you, I'm finding it rather difficult to set goals for the next year, because who in the world knows what the next year is going to look like? But here's at least a question to ponder as we think about who we will be in this coming year. Does my life reflect the identity that I know I have in Christ? Do I live as though I truly believe that I am forgiven, that I am a child of God, that my salvation is sure? Do I live as though I know that God is here with us? Am I listening for the voice of God saying to me, arise my child, my darling child, and follow me? For see, the winter is past. The time for singing has come. Can we look out over the snow and see that spring is already here. Would you pray with me? Holy God, the whole world is waiting. Waiting for a new year. Waiting for a vaccine. Waiting for spring. Waiting for a return to normal. We know waiting well. Christmas has come and gone, and we rejoice, but still we wait. 
help us to hold the balance of waiting and knowing, of looking for you and finding you, of longing for your coming, even as we delight in your presence. May we find practices and prayers to sustain our faith, the reassurance that you are present to us, even as we wait for you in your fullness and in your glory. There are those who need to know your presence in particularly powerful ways right now, God. So we pray today for doctors and nurses and receptionists and cleaning staff, for the many people working tirelessly to bring both healing and hope to those in hospitals. Give them strength and comfort and wisdom and bring healing to those who are sick, whatever their illness may be. We pray today for those who are lonely. We pray for those who suffer great anxiety. We pray for those whose health struggles have been long and who are growing weary of the fight. We lift up these cares before you, God, because we know that you have defeated the powers of darkness and sin, that you have brought spring into our lives, that in you there is life, and that life is the light for all people. So shine into our lives today and all days, O God. Give us eyes to see your light and willing hearts to poke that light into dark places. For even now, we know the warmth and joy of phone calls and FaceTime, of Christmas cookies baked and delivered, of pets snuggled up under the tree. We hear stories of goodwill, of people helping each other, and we are encouraged to do the same, encouraged to hold out hope. So may our lives reflect that hope, the hope that you are making all things new, that you will come again in glory, that you are here with us now. In the name of the Christ child, we pray. Amen. Friends, receive this blessing from the God who loves you. May God go before you to guide you. May God go behind you to protect you. May God go beneath you to support you and beside you to befriend you. Do not be afraid, but may the blessing of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit settle in among you and remain with you always. Do not be afraid, but go in peace to love and serve the Lord. And all God's children said, amen.